Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Monday, March 30th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here are tonight's top stories. Tonight, what rights do you give up when you fly? Then, drag queens attack the NSA, and the eyes of Google are upon you. Lidless eye wreathed in flame. It knows all your medical conditions, your history, where you eat, what size and color underwear your wife wears, what type of sex you're into. Well, despite the agency's claims that their mass surveillance program helps to thwart criminal activity, the NSA failed to stop two men dressed in drag from storming their gates. Now, these men, they tried to ram their SUV through a gate at the NSA headquarters in Fort Meade, Maryland. This prompted security to kill one of the men and seriously injure the other. Well, as we approach April, which is the official false flag month for the United States, it appears things are getting weirder and weirder. Yahoo News reports, men dressed as women shot outside NSA gate, tried to ram past checkpoint officials say. One man is dead and another is severely injured after a shootout at one of the main gates of the National Security Agency located at Fort Meade, Maryland. Two men dressed as women attempted to penetrate the entry point with their vehicle when a shootout occurred, officials said. My Fox DC also confirmed that these men were dressed as women. Fox News has reported that there were two occupants of the vehicle and that they were both men dressed as women. Aerial video shows a woman's wig on the ground outside a black SUV at the scene. Two people, a 20-year-old male and a 44-year-old male, were injured and flown to shock trauma in Baltimore. Now, they also mentioned that one of the occupants was declared dead on the scene and one was taken to the hospital. So it appears another person is injured, possibly a security guard, a bystander. It doesn't really say in this report. I'm sure that will come out as more information is released. But RT is reporting the FBI was quick to release a statement that this was no way an act of terrorism, even though they found a quantity of drugs in the car. There was a gun. These guys tried to penetrate through security and two men dressed as women and they're in a stolen SUV. In fact, the FBI released this statement. The shooting at the scene is contained and we do not believe is related to terrorism. We are investigating with NSA police and other law enforcement agencies, said a statement from the FBI office in Baltimore. NBC News reported that a highly placed official unauthorized to speak has openly said that the incident was a local criminal matter. So we have a black SUV that is reported stolen. We have drugs, a gun. You have men dressed up as women that try to ram through a gate at a NSA facility. Yet they're saying without a major investigation that there's no terrorism at all. But it seems as if, if, if this would have been a militia member, if the guy had a Gaston flag on and he would have been carrying one pistol, it would have been the end of the world. And this would have confirmed everybody's fears that returning vets and patriots are considered terrorists. Now, this isn't the first time the NSA has been attacked in the past month. In fact, earlier in the month, there was a young man named Hong Young, who's in his mid-30s, who was arrested for allegedly shooting twice at the building the NSA headquarters. He was also shooting at various vehicles in the area. He is now in jail now without bail, but it's interesting to see that in the past month, the NSA has been attacked on two occasions. What does this mean? Are people getting fed up with the fact that there's an organization in the government that is completely spying on everyone in the world and we can do nothing about it? There's no recourse for us. We just have to accept it. No, people obviously seem to be pissed off and are fighting back. It's just really interesting the fact that now it seems to be transvestites are now attacking the NSA. But maybe it'll come out that these two were government officials. Um, we just had the Secret Service. They were drunk coming back from a party, rammed the gate at the White House. It's been disclosed that now there's wild sex parties in Colombia with DEA agents, uh, Secret Service. I mean, it's like our government is out of control. Now, I'm not saying these guys are with the government. It'll probably come out that they weren't, but it just illustrates the amount of madness that is going on as we approach False Flag Month here in America. This is Rob Dew reporting for InfoWars.com and InfoWars Nightly News. So once again, the NSA fails to anticipate these events at its headquarters, uh, contradicting statements made in the past that we need all of this surveillance in order to stop criminal activity. Of course, they're probably going to use this incident as a reason for even more dragnet surveillance. Um, it's Obviously, pop population control mechanism, much like the TSA, contrived security theater. 
Now, obviously, we've reported many times that both agencies have failed to stop a single terror attack. Most of the terror attacks that they stop are uh, created by the FBI themselves. But here's a lovely little article up on Yahoo today. Five rights that you lose whenever you board a plane. Oh, nice. So trendy, <laughs> giving away your rights in order to travel. They obviously, the right to free speech. They say right there in their agreement that the carrier may refuse to transport or remove passengers for all kinds of violations, including clothing that is lewd, obscene, or patently offensive. Obviously, freedom from search and seizure. We get the grope down by TSA agents. And then, of course, they're seizing things like your water bottle or plastic toy guns. And then they go on to just talk about some other things, freedom of expression. They don't allow certain kinds of pets and things like that to come on the plane. And if you smell bad, if you have a foul odor, you can also be stopped from flying. Now, all of this security theater, like I said, hasn't stopped a single terror attack. And that is why former NSA official and whistleblower William Binney told InfoWars that bulk surveillance is destroying representative government. It's in favor of authoritarianism. He said that we're doing such a good job that the Russians and others that we used to call totalitarian states are now adopting the procedures that we implemented. So obviously this shows you that we're going in the wrong direction. And here we have the government simply using the guise of crime prevention to take away people's rights, control the population, implement this mass surveillance. Isn't it about time we repeal the Patriot Act? America, Congressman Thomas Massey, Republican of Kentucky and Representative Mark Pocan, Democrat of Wisconsin, need your support. Earlier this week, they introduced legislation into the House to abolish the Patriot Act. You know, the Patriot Act, the cancer that's been metastasizing the body politic since three days after the 9-11 attacks. The bill, dubbed the Surveillance State Repeal Act, H.R. 1466, would prohibit U.S. spooks from plating back doors into technology, as well as provide extended protections for whistleblowers such as Edward Snowden. In addition to repealing the Patriot Act, the legislation would also abolish the 2008 FISA Amendments Act, which the NSA has largely used to claim its mass spying programs are legal. H.R. 1466 states that any future snooping involving American citizens would be subject to strict oversight and require warrants in all cases, as well as probable cause. The legislation would also prohibit the government from forcing tech companies to install back doors in their products to enable NSA surveillance. Surveillance law enforcement lobbying groups have been pushing for some time, while security experts and those within the tech sector claim the NSA back doors will have disastrous consequences. The new legislation would also provide for an independent controller to receive complaints from whistleblowers and to protect them by reporting any valid information to Congress on their behalf. Unfortunately, the bill stands very little chance of passing given that so many bought and paid for representatives in Congress largely support the unconstitutional Patriot Act because their hands are tied by special interests and their minds clouded by hubris. There is too much money in this process of doing bulk acquisition of data. That, that's their motive to, get to, to keep having the money flow and keep that, keep that going. So um, there's... Uh, Changing that particular procedure is rather difficult within, even within government because this money comes out and goes to corporations that are in the constituent areas of the representatives and senators. So they have a vested interest in also keeping this going. So the only way to do it is to raise up as a public. We have to start standing up as Americans. Americans aren't supposed to sit back and, and let things happen and, and uh, let, uh, let government do what it does. We're supposed to be out there challenging. We have to be participating in our, in our, in our democracy and republic. We cannot sit by and let these things happen and be quiet. If we do, we're going to get this totalitarian state that we're sliding toward right now. You can't sit there and say you don't have any, you, you don't make, you don't have any power. You really do have power. And the power is to talk to your analysts or to your uh, representatives and senators and complain to them and make sure that it's, this is a major concern to you. And when they come around to, um, to give you town meetings and talk to you and get your vote, stand up and, and, uh, and address them and, and make them publicly come out with a statement of their position on this issue.
If you don't, I mean, they're going to continue doing what they, uh, conti- they, they are doing right now. They, they simply say uh, they're assuming, uh, because now if you're not complaining, they're assuming that you're okay with everything they do or they, they, they feel they can do anything and the, com- the country will accept it. And as long as they keep saying things um, <clears throat> and not telling the truth and exposing what's really going on, they can keep you in the dark and you'll never know. Do you want a peaceful solution to the madness of Big Brother's unwarranted overreach into our lives? Flood those phones and demand your representative rehabilitate our Constitution by voting in favor of H.R. 1466. Take your power back. This country belongs to we, the people. Representatives can be identified and contacted here. I live in America. Right on. That's what I'm talking about. Another high five. John Bauer for Infowars.com. Well, Google has morphed from a company that was created by a bunch of friends in grad school to a mega corporation that pervades the lives of millions, hundreds of millions of people across the world. Google controls what we buy, the news that we read, and even some of the Obama administration's policies. Now, to just get an understanding of just how big a problem it's going to be if Google becomes the truth filter, You have to just take a look at the chummy relationship between Google and the current administration in the White House. We've, uh, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks reported on some recently leaked series of emails revealing this relationship between Google and the NSA. In one email, General Alexander referred to Google as a key member of the defense industrial base, which is, of course, state newspeak for the military industrial complex. Now, we've also got a former Google officer as the president's chief technology advisor. Google employees contributed more to President Obama's re-election than the employees of any other company out there except Microsoft. Google lobbyists met with the Obama White House uh, officials on average once a week. And guess where Google's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, was uh, on election night in 2012? He was there right in the president's office working for the president. He was there with people. They were uh, working on a voter turnout system designed to help get the president reelected. So he was there controlling the system that automatically sent uh, phone calls to people reminding them to go out and vote. So this is the Google executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, working for the president. And coincidentally, right, right soon after in 2012, the FTC dropped its inquiry against Google. Google was accused of um, burying its competitors in search results. Well, lo and behold, that got thrown out. And of course, the FCC's net neutrality plan was just revealed. Nobody knew what was in it, but according to uh, this report, we have 15 pages of this agreement being amended or dropped altogether. I guess Google got word of it. They weren't happy with it. So amended the entire plan to suit this corporation's needs. And of course, you know, they scratch each other's back because Google helped fix the Obamacare website, all those glitches there. Uh, But all of that can be easily forgiven compared to what Google is planning next. Politically filtered information. Now, Google says that in the future, its determinations about what's true and what is untrue will play a role in how search engine rankings are configured. Google, of course, has the power to bump an article or website it doesn't like, and it's purporting to be the purveyor of truth without mastering a completely unbiased and objective system. So we're talking about a company whose CEO danced the night away with Obama on election night, whose employees donated more to the Obama campaign. Obviously, we're not talking about a neutral corporation, and it's going to go on. This chummy relationship isn't going to end when Obama leaves office, it's gonna go on regardless of who is the president. And that's alarming because we know that aside from this, these filters, Google also dominates the online ad market. And this is a huge source of their gatekeeping power. And if a website running its ads contains content that Google or its friends in the government find objectionable, well then Google can just pull those ads until that content is removed. Now, most independent sites, of course, depend on the income that they generate from these ads. Uh, We Are Change just tweeted out this weekend that the same thing had happened to them. They'd gotten their AdSense pulled because the content was objectionable. 
and uh, antiwar.com, which is a long-running daily news commentary, um, very critical of U.S. foreign policy, they just saw their site targeted this month as well. Uh, this happened on the morning of March 18th. Eric Garris, who's the founder and webmaster of the site, says that he received a form email from Google AdSense informing him that all of antiwar.com's Google ads had been disabled. And the reason was given that one of the site's pages with ads on it displayed images that violated the policy. They were violent or disturbing. Uh, this included gory text and images. Um, but the images in question weren't snuff. They weren't there to titillate the senses, anything like that. They were famous pictures of the prisoners who were detained at Abu Ghraib, the U.S. military prison in Iraq. These were those famous pictures that showed detainee abuse that actually got a lot of the American public against the war. And so that's the issue uh, that we're seeing here again, because Garris is saying, of course, the timing of this out of the blue enforcement was highly suspect, given the fact that we are ramping up for another war with Iraq and, and the Middle East as well. We're going to surely see another wave of violence and abuse. And that's what he's pointing out is that the, this page had been up for 11 years. And all of a sudden now they're taking these extreme measures to block this content. Um, now, his argument here is that war it, photography is the bane of all war makers. Images like the Pulitzer Prize winning photograph of a naked Vietnamese child fleeing a napalm attack played a major role in turning American public opinion against the Vietnam War and against war in general. That's why you're never going to see images of the dead bodies on the mainstream news. You're only going to see the images of the, the flag-draped casket. It's honorable. It's the honorable side of war. And here he asks, are ads to only appear next to pictures of the comfortable and well-groomed elites who start wars? and never the bloodied and bedraggled plebes who suffer them. So this is the same website, Google, or search engine, whatever you want to call it. They gave John Kerry a platform on their front page to gear the American public up for war with Syria. He was there going on the debunked claims of a chemical weapons attack. They allowed all of those images to be put up of the chemical weapons attack. Right there on Google, they say, hey, come join us today via Hangout. Secretary Kerry is going to answer questions live on Syria. So when it suits the Obama administration's narrative, they're going to help it out. They're not going to censor it. They're going to pop up those ads. They're going to even push it and say, come and join us here. That's the, that's the issue with Google being the purveyor of truth and having the power to silence certain websites and certain articles that aren't following the, the White House talking points. Uh, they can remove ads. They can take down entire YouTube channels and decide what will see the light of day. And this is the big issue with allowing Google to control the narrative. Well, a student in Florida was suspended last week for the crime of documenting a teacher bullying one of her students. This is 11-year-old Brianna, and she says that her science teacher was being mean to another student so she says she took out her cell phone and began to record this incident. She thought that this recording would help to prove her story, saying, do you think that they would actually believe a student over a teacher? But instead of thanking her for bringing it to their attention, they called it illegal and suspended her for five days. Now, it's pretty much saying, of course, to these students, if you think something is wrong, don't try and do anything about it. I thought I did the right thing. Brianna says one of her science teachers was being mean to a student, so she took out her cell phone and started recording what she says were threats by her teacher to a classmate. And don't let the science fool you. I will drop you. <laughs> yeah, all right. You don't know me. That's all I'm telling you. So don't give me no look. Brianna says the teacher had been mean to students before. This time, she wanted to prove it. You think that they would actually believe a student over a teacher? So I guess see something, say something only applies when you're tattling on your parents or your neighbors and not on your bullying teachers. Now, there in Florida, under the law, recording someone without their knowledge is legal when there is no expectation of privacy, which you would think is the case in a public school. But what about privacy in your own home? 
Now we have several schools in England who are threatening to call child protective services and have parents arrested if they find out that their children are allowed to play video games like Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty. And they're even threatening uh, these parents with arrest if they allow their children to go on Facebook and WhatsApp. Jakari Jackson here for Infowars.com. You know, back in the 1950s, a bunch of comic book publishers got together and created the Comics Code Authority. They did this because comics were the ill of media at the time, and Congress was threatening to come down on them and censor their works. Fast forward to when I was a child, you had Eminem and Marilyn Manson being blamed for the shooting at Columbine. When a dude's getting bullied and shoots up your school and they blame it on Marilyn. The point I'm trying to make here is that every generation has its own scapegoat media, which is blamed for social problems. And this generation is no different. They talk about games like Black Ops. They talk about games like Grand Theft Auto. And while I will agree with you, those games are not appropriate for children, I don't think parents should be arrested or have the police call on them for allowing their children to play such games. On the site, we have a memo from the Netwitch Education Partnership. And it says, if your child is allowed to have inappropriate access to any game or associated product that is 18 plus, we will are, this is the educational partnership, we will are advised to contact the police and children's social care as it is neglectful. Now, are there things in M-rated games that are inappropriate for young children? Of course there are. The same thing with R-rated movies and explicit content music. But I'm not calling for the censorship of any of these things, and I definitely don't want parents be put in a slammer because their children experience these things. And since we want to talk about the school system, I'm much more concerned about what the school system is doing when you have children being kicked out of school for eating their Pop-Tarts the wrong way, or children being suspended for playing with toy guns in their front yard. And let us not forget, school systems spying on children through laptops. And while I can't pin any of those things on this particular educational system, the school systems do have a whole lot to answer for. You can find more reports on InfoWars.com. The Jade Helm military exercise, set to take place in nine U.S. states this summer, has prompted concerns about preparations for martial law in America. But could the real purpose behind the drill be centered around a mock invasion of Iran and Syria and a huge Middle Eastern war? As we've exhaustively documented, these drills are clearly dual purpose, and there are plans in place to use the army in a law enforcement capacity to intern Americans during mass domestic unrest. But as Sputnik News documents today, Jade Helm seems to be geared around a much more sinister project, namely, quote, a preparation for an invasion of Iran and a Middle East-wide war. Look at this map, you'll recognise it as being from the Jade Helm exercise documents, but it's been amended slightly. The image is rotated to represent the approximate position of countries within the Middle East. So instead of Texas, Utah and a pocket of California being represented as hostile states, the rogue nations become Iran, Syria and Palestine, with Iraq currently under siege by ISIS, leaning hostile. Israel, Lebanon and Turkey in blue are friendly states. The US states are also comparable in some ways to the Middle Eastern countries they represent. New Mexico has vast swathes of desert like Iraq. Utah has both mountains and flatlands like Syria. California generally has a more gentle Mediterranean climate like Israel. Then look at the different operations that will be undertaken during Jade Helm, and the implications are alarming. In Utah, the equivalent of Syria, there will be a huge mock battle located here, with the enemy being the army of a simulated country. Apply this to the Middle East, and we're talking about the Syrian army, allies, of course, with Iran. Also during Jade Helm, Two unidentified operational detachment groups will also be dispatched to the capital here, simulating a covert operation in Damascus, Syria. Being a permissive blue state, Colorado, or Turkey, would allow NATO and US forces to move through the area unimpeded. California, or Israel, is also listed as a permissive blue state. 
No deployments of troops are planned to California during Jade Helm, just as no US troops would need to enter Israel during an invasion of Iran and Syria. The insurgent pocket shown on the Jade Helm map probably represents the West Bank and the coastal Gaza Strip, although it could also represent Hezbollah forces in Lebanon who would oppose a US invasion of Iran. Arizona, or Jordan, will be the site of the Special Forces Operational Detachment Headquarters, ODH, and a Marine Corps site during Operation Jade Helm, simulating Jordan's capital, Amman. And of course, the primary focus of Operation Jade Helm will of course be Texas, at least 17 Texan cities involved in the exercise, which of course tells us that the mock invasion of Iran is the centerpiece and the focus of this drill. So as you can see, the location, terrain and operational activities that characterise Jade Helm can all be transposed onto a simulated invasion of the Middle East. As four-star general Wesley Clark revealed, after 9-11, the Pentagon rubber-stamped a plan to invade the entire Middle East, country by country. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, Sir, you gotta come in, you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They have just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. With Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya already ticked off the list, does Operation Jade Helm signal that a US attack on Iran and Syria and a potentially devastating wider war throughout the region is coming sooner than we think? Check out the other videos, subscribe to the channel. I'm Paul Joseph Watson for Infowars.com. That's it for the show tonight. Please hit the subscribe button if you're watching us on the Alex Jones YouTube channel. And you can also become a subscriber to PrisonPlanet.tv. Your username and password can be shared with up to 20 people at the same time who will get instant access to the Alex Jones show, all of our special reports, movies, and our ebooks. Be sure to catch us here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Central. Okay. My mind is going. I can feel it.